Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our ongoing Cardiology Grand Round Series live from Debeki Studio. Uh, for all our viewers out there, uh, you can join to the, by web. And if you have the questions, you can go to pollev.com, enter Debeki, respond to the activity, or you can even join by text. Uh, text Debeki to 37607. Text in your message. We'll have your questions at the end of uh, our uh, Grand Round talk. So, uh, well, today uh, we have a, a very important topic, artificial intelligence. Uh, we all know it's reshaping and becoming a reality in every aspect of our life. Clearly, unparalleled advances in computational power, machine learning, has enabled all industries all across to identify stakeholders' needs and solutions faster with more accuracy to allowing us to make informed decisions quickly. Now, there's so much to be optimistic about the potential of digital and big data transformation healthcare. Uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, in no other time in the history of mankind, we had access to so much health data. For example, in 2020, almost 20, 300 billion gigabytes of data was generated, uh, which if you think about exceeds about two and a half time capacity just to house it. So one may argue that we may need AI to track it. Uh, however, as I ra I've raised your anticipation, I'm even quicker to give you a realistic check. Uh, despite so much data and opportunity, uh, we feel that very few among us can claim to have seen any meaningful shift in how we practice medicine. It's true that we have discovered a lot of data reservoir, but have we converted that into any meaningful product is yet to be seen. But that said, uh, uh, I'm very optimistic, as I said, again, of the future, as many healthcare systems, as well as industry partners, are responding rapidly, not waiting for others to change, but taking destiny in our own hands. For example, at Houston Methodist, challenged by the leadership, we are responding with a huge investment for accelerating access with, to data, with tools for refining it to, into actionable information in-house as well as with partnerships all around. Uh, so we can improve the healthcare need for at least twice the number of the patient at twice the speed. I must say a, a, a little biased though, but within the realm of healthcare, cardiology has inherently been a high-tech field, and as a result, we have seen some of the most exciting advancements in AI and machine learning so far. So, to further hear more on this topic on how AI can transform cardiovascular health, I, I cannot think of any better person who knows more about it than our special grand round speaker, Dr. John Runsfeld, who needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Runsfeld is the currently the professor of medicine, University of uh, uh, Colorado. Uh, he also is the inaugural director of health technology research, Reality Labs at Meta, also called Facebook. Uh, previously, Dr. Ramswell served as the chief innovation officer for the American College of Cardiology with a focus on digital health, advanced clinical analytics, and precision medicine. He was previously also the chief scientific science officer for the American College of Cardiology National Cardiovascular Data Registries and past chair of the American Heart Association Quality of Care and Outcome Research Scientific Council. So without further delay, welcome, John. Uh, we look forward to your thoughts and further discussion on this critical topic. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Karm, for having me. And let me do a quick check that I the sound level is good. Absolutely. We are all good. OK. Great. Well, well, thank you. You know how much uh, I would prefer to, uh, that we were doing this in person. We, I think we almost could have pulled it off. It uh, would have been uh, fantastic to be there with so many friends uh, and colleagues, uh, including yourself, and I hope to see many of you at, at the ACC um, uh, and catch up in person. I'd love to do that. Let me share my uh, screen and this and um, I really appreciate the chance to spend some time with you this morning and talk exactly along the lines of what you were just saying, um, Karim, about our AI, the potential of AI, but also the challenges uh, with regard to cardiovascular care delivery. And, and, and I think a question that has been asked for more than a decade is, are we there yet or are we uh, getting there? 
I, I do have two disclosures. I won't be talking about either one of these uh, today, but I am a member of the Steering and Publications Committees for the Apple Heart Study through Stanford. And as you mentioned, uh, I'm now uh, leading the health technology research uh, team at Reality Labs. Um, so let's go back uh, to what many have argued opened the era of AI in, in medicine or in healthcare. However, it's not now not recent. This is all the way back to 2009 uh, when uh, data scientists at Google uh, used internet search data to track the spread of influenza. And they showed that they could do it faster and more accurately than the CDC. And this, for many people, was a light of, wait a minute, there's more and more digital healthcare data. This is huge potential, maybe even necessary given all this data, as you said, uh, to, to improve the efficiency, the outcomes, really everything in healthcare delivery uh, was ripe for disruption from AI. And you could sign uh, article after article uh, predicting uh, healthcare as the next frontier for what initially was mostly called big data and the, the nomenclature quickly changed over to either uh, AI or machine learning, which are essentially equivalent uh, terms. You mentioned it, but it's based on this, the why. Why now? Uh, it has everything to do with exponential growth in digital healthcare data, uh, meaning that uh, we, we have the really the ability to apply these tools that thrive in large complex data sets and really are beyond the comprehension of any single uh, human uh, to, to cover. Uh, we can just look at the exponential growth in the medical literature, even as just one tiny example, much less EHRs, bio markers, et cetera, um, imaging, uh, no matter where you go, it gets uh, quickly beyond us as individuals, but are there ways we can harness uh, that data? Well, certainly there have been big bets uh, in this area uh, following uh, uh, the IBM Watson winning Jeopardy. Uh, there very rapidly after that, IBM uh, launched, as we all know, I think, uh, Wat IBM Watson Health uh, and had a series of very high profile um, uh, collaborations uh, in all sectors of healthcare, uh, but including with health systems like MD Anderson, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, et, et cetera, et cetera, all, all with a tremendous promise that this is how AI would be brought to the bedside, would be brought to actual uh, clinical uh, decision-making. And I think sort of the mid 2000s was, was a peak of, of, of promise uh, for how we would fundamentally change how we take care of our patients uh, on the front lines. This was fueled though uh, at, you know, always follow the money. <laughs> and uh, in, along the way here, you had very reputable uh, groups like McKinsey estimating that by deploying so-called big data analytics or AI uh, in healthcare that could enable more than 300 billion in savings per year in US just by improving efficiency or decreasing uh, inefficiencies uh, in the system. And that just spurred investment. So, this has been really unrelenting in terms of st AI startup funding being infused into the system, both in the U.S. and uh, globally. And there were a lot of questions about what would happen. Um, it would, would there still be f in infusion of funds into startups when the, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic or into the COVID pandemic? And the answer is, is that it increased. Uh, this slide goes through quarter four of 2020, but I can uh, share with you that 2021 was the largest single investment uh, in startup AI startup companies, both in the U.S. and worldwide, but wide by some margin. So this is a continued infusion of funding into the sector. And it's important to stop and realize this is just startup funding, um, right? So this isn't the large bets or the large investments in anything health care related by large tech companies, uh, but also importantly by our, the life science uh, companies, you know, pharma and, and medical device companies that we all know so well, um, absolutely uh, have major uh, investments uh, in AI and machine learning uh, and for many of their products. It's been said by 
many in the med- in the cardiology medical device world, people like Marty Leon, that, that you know that the future of cardiovascular medical devices is the fusion of digital health and AI with those medical devices, and I believe that's true. But what has all this investment bought us so far? Um, is it's an important question. This is a lot of investment, a lot of promise, and how is that translated? Uh, into how we care for our patients. Well, so far, what it's largely done is lead to this, the launch of companies, Um, you know, almost a kaleidoscope, hundreds, if not thousands worldwide, focused on various aspects of applying AI in healthcare. Uh, And and no one can keep up a slide like this because startups come and they go, they change all the time. Uh, There are pockets where they've been successful. You may have some examples locally or regionally, but for the large part, uh, they had the impact and the scaling uh, that is necessary to re- reap the promise of AI and healthcare. And I think we have to say probably not, because if you, even if you see headlines like this, you know, it's hard not to say, so AI predicts heart attacks better than doctors. Well, if that's true, we should be using that uh, in our daily care of our patients. There's also been interestingly, um, some concern raised or some uh, worry uh, raised about the future of our roles in healthcare as clinicians. Will we be as needed uh, as we are now? This has been both in, in our own, um, in the medical literature to some degree, uh, asking about the uncertain future uh, uh, for us uh, in, in, in as, as AI grows and becomes more mature, uh, but outside, you know, in the in the blogs, uh, you know, in the in the articles, it's it's almost humorous the type of headlines you'll see. Uh, headlines like this: Your doctor may not be your future doctor may not be human. This is the rise of AI in medicine, uh, making us maybe squirm and say, "Well, what do they mean by that?" And yet, and yet, <laughs> I'm reminded of this which is uh, an exam room at the VA, uh, which my entire uh, clinical career has been in the VA. And I can pretty much assure you that this exam room looks the same as the day I arrived many, many years ago as a fellow uh, until now, the only exception uh, being when they, we changed from paper to, to the computer, to the EHR. That's hardly a artificial intelligence, (laughs) digital transformation. There's a lot of, pros and cons and not what I'm focusing on today, but there's not a lot of AI being deployed here uh, day in and day out in clinic. I like to point out that even the clock on the wall isn't digital. Um, So how can there be such a gap uh, between the promise, the the digital availability of digital data, the promise of the techniques, the huge investment, the huge bets that are being made, uh, even in the traditional life science companies and hospitals and health systems, how is it just not gotten there? Or maybe the important question is, how do we get there? What's 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 the way forward? Um, uh, I think to have a way forward, you have to diagnose what the problem is. What what why hasn't it worked? And and you know the bottom line is it's easy to say, well, it's mostly been hype so far. But I'd like to go a little deeper than that and just take some time here. And then we're gonna turn the ship around to where do we go next or what are the the promising parts of it? Because I'm ultimately, just like uh, Kuram, I'm ultimately quite optimistic about it. But I think we have to be realistic about what AI can do, what it can't do and where it's best deployed. So first of all, if you go back to the thing that got it started, the prediction of flu, uh, that got everybody so excited about AI and healthcare, it stopped working after a couple of years, few years. So the same Google scientists using the same data in the internet, all of a sudden the predictive models weren't working uh, as well uh, to track the flu. No, it's difficult to exactly pinpoint why, but for example, internet data isn't necessarily high quality data. It changes over time, which can lead to unstable prediction. You can have real problems with false positives and model overfitting. And the sort of scary thing, I think, for us as clinicians making real decisions about patients with our patients and their families is it can be difficult to know when AI models change their performance. You're going to need ongoing monitoring if we're ever going to use them to make real decisions. Let me go back to this headline. There was an NBC News about AI predicts heart attack better than doctors. 
And I want to be very careful here that this is in no way a criticism of the uh, of the authors or those that did the research. I applaud them for doing real research around machine learning or AI and publishing their results. But I think we need to assess the literature on AI and uh, cardiovascular care and outcomes the same way we would any new therapeutic or a new device. You know, it needs the same level of bar of evidence, something I'll probably say several times, because if you get past the headline here that AI predicts heart attack better than doctors and look at the study, you quickly realize it really wasn't about AI predicting heart attacks better than doctors at all. What they actually studied was the ASCVD risk score in comparison to a much larger data set on which they applied many you know, hundreds of variables. They applied machine learning uh, techniques and they found that by using the additional data and using machine learning, you got a margin, I would argue, clinically marginal uh, difference uh, increase in the C index or, or a UC area under the curve. But what I think was not uh, probably highlighted enough is that if you use plain old logistic regression, you know, plain old boring biostatistical <laughs> logistic regression, um, it was just as good as the machine learning. Uh, and so I believe in this instance, probably the correct interpretation is that the use of uh, machine learning did not give clear advantage over to traditional uh, prediction techniques. So we're gonna have to find where it would be better rather than sort of claiming uh, that it was did something uh, magical. If you go to the startup world, and again, I'd like to emphasize that I'm in some ways complimenting, it won't sound like it necessarily, but I'd like to compliment uh, the startup companies that publish their results, uh, you know, that publish their data uh, 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 rather than a, it being totally a black box. So I'd like to, say it's great that this startup um, uh, did so. On the other hand, and I get why they have to promise things, they're in the startup world, they're trying to advance their cause. But if we but if we look at the actual evidence, sometimes it's not as robust as it sounds what they're predicting. They're, they're saying through predictive analytics, they can reduce total population medical expense and 30 day readmissions. And they did a focus on ER uh, revisits. But if you look at the actual underlying uh, study of risk prediction for emergency department revisit. Um, and they employed pretty straightforward machine learning techniques, they had EHR data, claims data, et cetera. Um, you know, the C statistics, again, or area of the curve were pretty modest in these risk predictions. And e they even highlighted in, in the study, if you want to pull it, they highlighted a single case of a 59 year old female that had 14, let me say that again, 14 emergency department revisits over a 12 month period. And their risk prediction model really took off after uh, the fourth revisit. Um, it, it gave a very high chance that she would come back a fifth time. And I, I think I would argue that, I don't know that that's clinically useful for us. I think probably we, we could have guessed that uh, without uh, machine learning. So we're also you have to be careful about what problem we're trying to solve uh, and, and, and the level of evidence and where we deploy it. There are methodologic um, questions too that we need to, to keep an eye on. I mean, I think using AI and ML in, in medicine and in cardiovascular care is gonna take a very high bar of methods. Um, we need to have be as rigorous about this as we are uh, with, with other areas of tra uh, basic translational and clinical trial research, et cetera. Um, and there are leading biostatisticians. Many of you will know Frank Harrell uh, as being a leading thinker, biostatistician. Uh, his, certainly his blog, Statistical Thinking, uh, at the top here is, is worth uh, knowing of and reading if you, you enjoy this stuff. And he is asked several times questions along these lines as medicine mesmerized by machine learning. And he's really focused on using EHR data uh, because that seems to be the primary place it gets deployed. And he's pointed out that if you look at sort of traditional risk prediction and the way we think about risk, that machine learning thinks is different. It's taking patterns of care and groups it's grouping data and then saying, and creating so-called classifiers to say, you're, you, we, we put you in this group against this outcome or this group against this outcome. It's not quite the same interpretation. It may not be optimal for um, interpretation. It also can be somewhat black box. And because it's based on observational data, what's documented in this case in the EHR, we have the usual problems we have with observational data that correlation is not causation 
and underlying data quality uh, is critical. Um, something to say more about. If you want something a little more colorful and amusing, Abraham Verghese, many of you will know as a leading thinker in medicine at Stanford, uh, wrote in the New York Times uh, in <clears throat> 2018, talking about uh, uh, the potential for AI, but really honing in on this idea that where everybody seems to want to start is to apply AI uh, machine learning to the electronic health record, and that that may be fraught with uh, trouble. You know, good data is critical for medical applications for AI machine learning. The messy nature of medical data of EHR makes the task difficult. And he concluded, garbage in begets garbage out, sanitized, pretty, color-coded garbage, but garbage nonetheless. So where does that leave us? Well, <laughs> I hopefully noticed, uh, despite being in the middle of the pandemic, uh, but, you know, IBM ended up folding IBM Watson Health. Uh, it did not succeed uh, with their audacious plan to change the face of healthcare with AI. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, but not so far off of what I was just saying, which that a lot of the bets made were dependent on the idea that EHR data represented ground truth. Uh, was high quality and also importantly could scale across uh, health hospitals and health systems that if you developed an uh, 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 AI model in one system or in one hospital with a consistent data source that it could then uh, port over to other uh, systems and that turns out to be very difficult. If we look at the less less headlines and, and more in the in the literature to date, uh, yeah, we're not seeing a strong signal that decision support systems based on machine learning or AI models are improving clinical diagnostic performance. But if you go into these um, articles, I think where you'll see is, again, the source of data in these tends to be mostly uh, claims data or EHR data. And we really have to ask the question whether that's the right place. There may be some useful applications, but is that really the best place to deploy AI uh, for our uses. What about registry data? Uh, we looked, um, and you'll see later that we had some mixed, um, uh, uh, we've had some mixed results about whether or not machine learning, uh, some positive, some neutral, but I want to sh share one that, that didn't show increasing uh, discernment. Uh, we uh, at ACC, uh, uh, working with primarily with the Yale group, um, applied the Yale uh, machine learning data science group uh, that Harlan Krumholtz has formed, uh, applied machine learning models to predict um, death after acute MI using the NCDR um, uh, data. And the machine learning models were not associated with substantive improvement and discrimination in hospital mortality, um, suggesting that they're not better than what we already had. Now there's a couple of issues here that I think are important. One, the existing models are all really good. Um, so it's hard to get better with a model that's performing really well. So maybe you don't wanna, you, maybe do we need to deploy machine learning in, in an area we already have strong uh, models. But I think the more subtle and important um, point to make is that claims data and EHR data suffer from poor data quality. Actually, registry data has high data quality, but it has low data dimensionality. In other words, in a, when we do registries, we do things like, does the patient have diabetes? Yes, no, right? We even tend to categorize age. Um, a lot of the details are put into just yes, no, dichotomous things. You lose information every time you categorize or dichotomize uh, variables and they become less dimensional. They're not high dimensional data. And this was uh, really emphasized in the, in the discussion around this paper, but it is summarized nicely even in, in, even in a tweet by our colleague, Steve Bradley, many of you will know, cardiologist now at previous at Colorado, now at Minnesota Heart, who, who in response to this paper wrote, hammers home the point a more complex model is only likely to perform better when detailed and complex data inputs are available. Uh, and I think that's right. So it begs the question again of how do we approach AI and cardiovascular care in a way. So I'm gonna pivot here. Um, many of you know the Gartner hype cycle so-called. Um, uh, and I think there are 
this isn't me saying this, many people have said this, that perhaps the best example in technology in the last 10 years for the Gartner hype cycle is AI and healthcare actually. And that it was started off with just way too high peak of inflated expectations. And that we've been a little bit in a trough of disillusionment, certainly the IBM Watson story and others have suggested that. I would suggest though, uh, there were pretty quickly on a funny phrase, but this slope of enlightenment and trying to get to where it can actually work for us. And and I don't think that's hype or, or hyperbole, but I'm going to try to uh, prove that in the final <laughs> uh, third here of, of, of my talk or the final third, third chapter of my talk. I'm taking that on as a challenge to say, well, I think we we got out of the gate too fast with too much promise, uh, but but there is a way uh, forward. So what is that way forward? I think some of it is grounding back in and what, what it is and what it does, what it's going to thrive at, what it's going to struggle with, as I've alluded to a little bit. Just as a reminder, AI is, a, is an array of data science methods, almost all of which involve machine learning techniques. So I'm going to say this a couple of times, but just for the non-data uh, science folks out there, uh, when you hear these different techniques, they really just, it's best just to, you can just think of them as, as ML techniques that are trying or can mimic human cognition in the analysis, presentation, and comprehension of complex data. And the things you want to emphasize in this uh, definition are mimic. Uh, they don't have any independent thought. Uh, so maybe the name is a problem, AI. Um, uh, and the last two words, uh, complex uh, data. So when we talk about big data or what sources of data, I do think too often we jump to one type of data, like either claims data or EHR data. And the growth is across all these types of digital data. And if you look across these, it's not just administrative registry and EHR data. I think where the real promise may be in the future is in those towards the bottom, you know, biometric data, uh, wearable and non-wearable biosensors, uh, medical imaging, you know, in general, going to be more scalable across sites, high, pretty high quality data. We'll still need humans in the loop on that, I'll say again. And, and you know, biomarker data, which is everything from omics to all types of biomarkers, uh, uh, can they come and in, come into play? And again, AI is just an umbrella term for a bunch of different um, uh, techniques uh, that, that we'll see. And, and, and I think if we explore different data types, which I'm going to do now, um, you, you can really start to see where the promise is. All right. So for AI to thrive in healthcare, you know, there, I think we can look at data success factors and there are more, there are others who are of course, deep uh, in the methods here will say, well, I would also add the following things, but I think for sure where it thrives, where AI can thrive is in large diverse data sources. It is highly dependent on the underlying data quality I think maybe may, that may have been missed um, early on in, the, in a lot of the applications. To avoid bias in the models, which can happen if it has non-representative data, you need representative data. To be able to have it deployed in more than one center, we're going to need reproducible data, which, yes, gets us to data in our interoperability, tough, tough, tough hill to climb. Uh, it, as I mentioned about registry data, it's going to be better with high dimensional data, you know, more complex data. And then an ability for humans to be in the loop. I think the, the best AI applications of healthcare are not gonna just be some magical unsupervised machine learning, but instead are gonna require us to guide uh, what are important features or variables, uh, characteristics uh, that we know based on clinical uh, pathophysiology or other uh, things to guide meaningful uh, uh, models. At risk of spending too much time on data, but I think it almost can't be overstated <laughs> when we're talking about AI and machine uh, learning. Um, this is a bit oversimplified, and so don't hold me to the exact where these fall on the grids. But just roughly speaking, if to round this out, if you have data quality on the vertical axis and data dimensionality on the horizontal axis, a lot of the data sources in medicine are not in the upper right quadrant, really. Uh, I mentioned clinical registry data as being high quality. It is, but it's low data dimensionality. Whereas the free text data in the electronic health records may have important information and have high data dimensionality, but, oh, you know, good luck comparing EHR notes uh, within a system, much less across systems. Um, and you can see why, my, why trying to apply these models might struggle. On the other hand, 
uh, imaging uh, data, biosensor data, uh, and potentially biomarker data, uh, I think are promising. Now, maybe you could combine those with aspects of EHR data, et cetera. But I think that uh, we're, we're seeing a real growth of most rapid growth in publication in AI and healthcare in general, and machine learning and cardiovascular applications is in imaging uh, and a little bit in biosensor uh, and biomarker uh, data. And it makes sense, right? So if you boil it down, uh, artificial intelligence should help us with things like statistical automation, where there's the, the right data, predictive analytics, and iterative pattern matching, which then leads us right back to wh which data sources make sense. And then I think we need a roadmap um, for how to develop and deploy these in care to do it responsibly so that we have the evidence so that we don't have bias uh, in the AI uh, models. And I think a lot of this was looked to be skipped, unfortunately, so many startup companies, stuff they just want to have a solution and get it in the hands of doctors and nurses and have them use it. Well, you know, the, the stakes are too high. Uh, and and uh, uh, now there's probably some simple administrative things, absolutely scheduling other things. Of course, I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about AI that would be we would be using to improve our di earlier diagnosis, make treatment decisions you know, make th uh, therapeutic or procedural decisions, you know, these need to be treated like you would a new drug or device or other therapy. So not so deep here, but, you know, best AI applications are going to, of course, start with what problem are we trying to solve? Not just here's a bunch of data, let's apply AI. Match the right method. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But for example, some of the ML methods do better with imaging data. Uh, these so-called convolutional neural networks, but again, doesn't matter, uh, AI, ML, and then lots of focus on how you're going to get the data sources of high enough quality to inform it. And I would argue if you can't answer these three things or solve against these three things, you probably should stop. Uh, it probably shouldn't go forward. If you can solve against those, then you need to overtly do and, and, and share with regulators if, if, if indeed this is gonna inform clinical decision-making, uh, the evidence on validation. The level of regulatory ap approval uh, is a work in progress at the FDA and other regulatory authorities around the world. But I hope you all have seen that the FDA has launched a digital health center uh, to address this, to lead this, and to take a, just like they do with medical devices, take a risk-based approach for levels of, of approval or clearance of, of AI uh, risk models. It's a, it's a complex topic because the AI models iterate or change over time, but they're developing a, a framework for how to do that. Um, and only then <laughs> do we really get, sure, to the left, you'll see, have studies in clinical settings, absolutely, but these are IRB uh, you know, guided studies, but only once you get past all that, do we actually get to how do we successfully do implementation, uh, clinical integration and practice. And even then we're going to have to astutely monitor for effectiveness and safety uh, of these model of these models in our use. And I think they're, it's unlikely they're going to work independent of us. They're going to work to make us more efficient and help us do what we do. Uh, uh, but not more than that. Now, I'm going to say something that might sound surprising after getting this far into the talk, which is we actually are all using AI already. We just don't see it. Um, it's not in the clinic room necessarily. It's not saying I'm pulling up and using a solution or an app and saying, I know it's an AI app. But, but, but in the background, a lot of the device companies and certainly the imaging companies here about GE, Siemens, and Philips, just as examples, you know, they've been deploying AI models in the background to do things like edge detection and better estimation of volumes for a long time, for years. Uh, so, so in some ways, AI is absolutely here. It just hasn't quite crossed over to, to our day, an evident way in our daily practice. We are seeing compelling things like this. This is uh, from Google. Um, who have published starting in 2016 and then, and then subsequently 2018, interesting uh, uh, application of AI looking at uh, retinographs. Um, makes sense, right? Because it's high, you get uh, imaging data, high quality data, uh, but look at the depth. This isn't to have a slide with a lot of word on it. I just want to show the depth in, of the research here, uh, the, that how the validation in separate data sets, the, the size of the cohorts, 
the reporting of the sensitivity and specificity for diabetic retinopathy, and then subsequently using a training data set of 285,000 patients' retinographs and validated on another 13,000, they can actually use AI to, to see not just a diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy, but they can actually accurately assess patient gender, smoking status, systolic blood pressure, major cardiac events, and degrees accuracy of any other traditional existing model. And while I have no insider um, information at all, uh, I believe uh, that they continue to develop these and will go through the steps that I just showed you, the regulatory and other steps to try to get this into practice. And you can see, I can see a direct way that this could be utilized immediately still with humans with us also uh, seeing what it interprets and then saying we agree or disagree. Uh, but you could see how this could be useful uh, uh, in clinical practice. Um, I'm just giving a few random examples. There's so many more out there uh, growing so fast, it's hard to keep up with. But I just want to talk briefly about ECG. You know, ECG can be thought of as a form of imaging, right? And so you can imagine training AI on it. The Mayo Clinic group, there are others for sure, perhaps at your own, in your own system. The Mayo Clinic group has really published a lot on this. Um, let me just say that none of it is deployed in their clinical care yet. It's still research. And if you talk to these investigators, which I have even of re recently, in recent weeks, this is tough work. This is tough research. It takes a lot of guided supervision of the model development to get them uh, to, to a level of, of performance and validation. But they are, it's really interesting stuff. It's not just what's the rhythm, which I think could be improved, <laughs> just interpreting the ECG, but you can see patterns that go beyond the human eye uh, that can be seen just because of the, the way that AI can do pattern matching on, on hundreds to thousands of ECGs. So they can, look, for example, in this study, uh, looking at sinus rhythm ECGs, uh, the AI can discern who has or hasn't had atrial fibrillation in the past. Uh, they need to prospectively validate that. And then if you go follow this, this group of um, investigators, you'll see other interesting studies about uh, what else they can detect in the ECG that goes beyond um, interpretation. I would imagine this getting into clinical practice sooner rather than later. What about echo? Now, echo is going to be tougher than cardiac CT, uh, MR, uh, things that don't move, um, <laughs> ECT, uh, you know, the, the 12 lead, um, uh, uh, but nonetheless is, is making forward progress. Uh, some of you will know cardiologists like Partho Sengupta and others who are leading this, or really thought leaders uh, in, in this area, but it's capital R research, taking steps towards what can it do, what does it thrive at? But I thought it's important to point out this is an exemplar uh, study that came out uh, in circulation in, in, in uh, the fall of 2018 um, on fully automated echocardiogram interpretation in clinical practice. Now, it's not, th this is a research study. Um, that doesn't mean they're using it in clinical practice yet, but they were tr able to train the eye to discern all the standard echo views with a very high accuracy and then did train it uh, using an ML technique uh, to detect cardiomyopathy, uh, amyloid, and, and pulmonary hypertension. Interestingly, the pulmonary hypertension without Doppler. Okay, so this is just ba based on, on, on the 2D um, uh, echo uh, images. Uh, so, so we're seeing some real uh, progress, or at least building of the evidence, which is what we need. Um, and here is Partho Sengupta's uh, group. Um, this is somewhat technical uh, study, but for those of you who are interested, I would uh, recommend reading it. It was in uh, Jack in 2019. Network tomography for understanding phenotypic presentations AS. Network tomography is a form of machine learning. But the important thing is what they're hinting at here is that I think in the future and not such a distant future, this idea that we're going to look and say, do people have mild, moderate, or severe AS is going to seem too simplistic. We're going to be able to discern better and AI is going to help us do this. Subsets of people who they may have what appears to be moderate AS, but it's going to be stable. And we'll know AS will know uh, through AI ML models. We're going to know who categorizes into that. They're unlikely to progress. We're also going to find some that may be even mild or mild to moderate who have a certain type of AS that's very likely to rapidly progress. We'll have to do prospective studies to know if we should intervene uh, surgically or with TAVR in those people and when, of course. Uh, but I think this is AIML is going to help us discern 
individual risk and uh, subsets of phenotypic presentation. Uh, I think that's the new era that's coming in AI ML as long as we do it uh, uh, thoughtfully. And last, and then I'm gonna just quickly go through some examples from the ACC uh, partnerships. Um, there still may be value that comes from AI in electronic health records. Now, the key to this study before it has a wow factor in the, in the size and the so forth, but you have to understand there on the, it's two hospitals on the same exact instance of an EHR. So there's no heterogeneity or interoperability problem. That's really important. But here it's a combination of researchers from Google, UCSF, and the University of Chicago and Stanford collaborating together, which I think is a great model. They uh, two hospitals, 216,000 patients, and in the HR, that leads up to, yeah, that, that's right. That's 46 billion, more than 46 billion data points. Good luck analyzing that in traditional biostatistics. And they have quite robust risk prediction models of in-hospital mortality, 30-day readmission, et cetera. Um, so it just suggests it's possible if we get the underlying data uh, uh, quality right. I'm going to more quickly, just for time here, um, to leave to leave lots of time for questions, uh, but also happy and follow up to talk about the ACC. ACC launched its um, 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 innovation program with this health policy statement published in 2017. Yes, with including a focus digital health, big data, and precision health. Um, we did here uh, to give a, a more. A different, we did first apply data to the NCDR, uh, applied machine learning models to NCR data, as I said, and I showed one before that didn't show much of a, a gain, uh, but here's one that is more in line with the individualized risk that I think is interesting, which is bleeding risk around PCI. Uh, when we do machine learning models, they do actually discern people better for bleeding risk, especially in moderate. So low, low bleeding risk is low, high bleeding risk is high, yep. But in the, in the middle, um, uh, and this is published in 2019, uh, you, I think we can do a better job of identifying who might benefit from bleeding avoidance uh, therapies across moderate risk is really heterogeneous uh, group. Um, the AACC innovation program is focused, I, I hope many of you know, or if not want to get involved uh, on the spectrum of digital transformation, which we define as virtual care, remote monitoring and AI driven care. Um, and, and there's lots of opportunity to get involved, but one of the novel things about the program, which I'm, you, you, you know, was obviously very involved in the last six years, but now uh, Ami Bhatt is now, for those of you who know from MGH, cardiologist is now leading it, um, is been centered on actually partnering with startup companies um, to uh, co-develop digital health and AI ML uh, applications. And, you know, that's gonna be slow, uh, and by the way, uh, just a disclosure, I'm not in any way endorsing any of these uh, uh, um, companies, they're startup companies, but it's a fantastic opportunity for ACC to be in on the ground level and co-develop, learn how to build the evidence base for these and deploy them in care. And a couple of these are making great progress. And I just want to show that they're not sort of abstract, that they actually exist. Um, one of them, again, not endorsing in any way is called Maya. Uh, Maya Health is actually deployed in the Mercy Health System uh, in St. Louis already in their hospital. They have a very large hospital at home program and they're using Maya as their only uh, remote monitoring platform. What I wanted to point out is unpublished uh, data, but just to, and so very pre preliminary, but I just want to point out they have kind of all the typical things we do at home monitoring, but where they're actually finding the highest quality data for the risk models is not from EHR data or even like scales or things like that. It's actually from the wearable stuff, uh, like a ring or, or something under the mattress while the heart failure patients uh, sleep with those. Th these are early models, but it's actually these, the biometric data that, or the wearable and non-wearable uh, data that's actually distinguishing who, uh, predicting who will uh, have decompensation, ignoring the EHR data, frankly, um, which is interesting. And, and they are deployed at both Mercy and running a study at uh, WashU at this point. Um, clearly, is a there's multiple companies in the area of um, CT, MR, CTA, uh, and machine learning that's coming along quickly. One of those is clearly, and we're working on a prevention study with Indiana University and the ACC. Uh, and I think the key is not 
Well, yes, the, the, the AI has a lot of promise for just doing the interpretation rapidly uh, in, increasing our efficiency in interpretation. You still have to have absolutely human in the loop uh, to do this, but it's also really good at the plaque evaluation, you know, necrotic plaque or more uh, fibrous calcified class which, plaque, which can inform prevention decisions. And I think that's where the exciting uh, part of the AI uh, comes in. Last, uh, just wanted to point out just a medical device application uh, through ACC is, is one of the innovation collaborators is Heart Hero. It's a handheld AED. It is approved, by the way, in Europe uh, and going to market and, and under FDA uh, consideration. It's a, maybe a minor point, but do you realize that the AEDs on the market use you know, hard-coded algorithms to, to assess whether to shock or not shock, uh, whereas Heart Hero is using machine learning and they get much better discernment uh, of rhythm, shockable versus non, non-shockable rhythms. And you know, it just makes sense because of the pattern uh, recognition. Let me finish with this point, uh, which I hope I got across uh, during this time, which is, this again comes from Abraham Verghese at Stanford, but also Bob Harrington. Um, uh, this is about AI, whether AI is just gonna replace us, uh, uh, you know, no, um, uh, but it, you know, this in this great uh, editorial they wrote in 2018, what this computer needs as a physician, it talks about this idea of augmented intelligence, which I think is the way forward. That is that we need to combine both in the design of these and the evidence and then the application in clinical care. From the beginning, we need to combine the AI ML techniques, which have a lot of power, but with clinical intelligence uh, to make us better and faster what we do. We need to prove it. Um, and I think that's where we are, and I think it's moving rapidly. I'll end with a quick story, which is difficult to do uh, remotely, but I <laughs> do it anyway. Um, oh, first of all, I'll quote, artificial intelligence, just remember it's math, not magic, so we shouldn't be intimidated by it. And then here's my, I had a phone call with a, a data, one of the Stanford data scientists, well-known, uh, uh, a couple, couple of years ago. Uh, we were supposed to be at a panel together, and they wanted to, the people running this, um, meeting wanted to pit us against each other, AI, de- uh, you know, um, should we fight about c- cardiologists? And they said the panel topic would be, will AI replace cardiology? And before I could say anything, I was going to say, okay, we could discuss that. The data scientist jumped in and said very strongly, no, because it's a stupid question. It's never going to happen. And it gets in the way of talking about how AI can help cardiologists. And then he said very quietly under his breath, I'm not so sure about radiologists, though. So that's my that's my story, and I'm going to end there. Uh, and thank you so much for for inviting me. Uh, I hope to do it in person, and again see you at ACC. All right, Kerem, up back to you. Well, uh, John, your last co- quote is very interesting. I will definitely pass on this to my wife, who's a radiologist. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, as always, uh, hearing from you clearly energizes our hope on the potential of MI to improve patient outcomes across the spectrum of uh, the research through hospital care. But again, you gave us a cautionary note that the development and implementation still remains in the early stage of maturity. Now, as I'm learning, what are we focused on and what's more important? And let me try to explain what I'm thinking out here. So if you and I look around and ask the question, what other industries are doing with their data? It appears most of them are to reduce variation in production with goals of superior product, uh, greater longevity, lower price, which in healthcare lens is about quality, outcomes, and cost. Now, what I have seen and what you have shown clearly what's happening under the hood in our healthcare R&D effort in this space is uh, rather than emphasizing data applications to enhance healthcare delivery, I think we still remain preoccupied in prediction models, which don't get me wrong, are critically important. And in many in our community still believe that, that the largest opportunity for AI is prediction of disease and precision medicine. But... Do you think we should be investing more time, resources, infrastructure in the basic applications prior to getting excited about the more futuristic uh, needs? Uh, And why is this not happening more? Because do you think it's not sensational enough to be published in digital nature, innovative enough to get an NIH grant, or maybe transformative enough for industry to invest billions of dollars in these applications? 
Yeah, I, I, it's very well stated, and I think you're right on. I, I've got, I know I can't see everyone, but I can't imagine that people, I'd be shocked if people weren't nodding as you were saying that, because I think you hit all the high points, which are, look, we got everybody's attention, started with risk prediction, and everybody said, oh, this is going to be amazing, and then, then there was all this, oh my gosh, is it going to you know, replace us, as I said, but they actually started in the hardest place for it to show value uh, and where it actually has the most risk because you could have bias in the models and so forth. Um, I think your point is that it wasn't maybe sensational enough. And that's right, because when you're in the startup world, which I've spent a ton of time in the last six years, they, ha they have to raise money. And the only way you raise money from VCs and other places is by promising the kind of impact that would come from those but so much of it i think was unrealistic what i think is that you know it'll it'll steady state of increase in in um, evidence as i tried to show towards the end and applications will be coming into our hands especially around imaging and other things in the next five years i believe but behind the scenes there's so much promise and i didn't really get into this of course it's not really my area of expertise but in things like supply chain uh in in patient flow in uh, anywhere you can think statistical automation, uh, AI and ML should thrive, especially if, again, you have the, the high, high quality data. And I, you're right, it's hard to get excited about that, but I think probably health systems um, are increasingly interested in how they could leverage those solutions, maybe moving away from the AI prediction dashboard that a lot of them bought into early on, or they got burned and they don't, they're hesitant to do it. But I think a lot of them are looking at it. And I really turn uh, to, to places like the medical device industry. I think where you're going to see is where, just like I showed a little with the one slide, in the background in what, you know, the imaging companies do and the device companies do, including implantable and other devices, they're increasingly deploying AIML to be have to, for efficiency. Uh, and to link what, let's say you implant, whatever you implant to monitor long-term for safety and follow-up. Um, I think that's where you're gonna see huge gains. Well, uh, thanks, John. So on, on the same topic, just going through, and, and again, looking through the lens of maybe an operational healthcare leadership, and on a daily basis, we see machine learning intelligence tools dangle before our eyes. and. Uh, you know, how would you advise us to assess where I feel there are four areas of challenges? For example, do I trust them? The ability to assess the validity and reliability of this. Am I derived outputs in different environments, which you pointed out? Then explainability is an important issue. Is how does this black box or al algorithms even work? And you take it to the next step is usability and the extent to which the, our systems can and they can be applied to achieve the specified task in helping the operational goals of effectiveness, efficiency, patient engagement, in multiple wearing healthcare environments, and finally, more importantly, what's the transparency and fairness? Do we really know and understand the aspects of data set input that can influence the outputs, uh, such as in clinical decision supports, for, and the issue of bias in that. We have seen some of those elements coming up in the general media. How, how do you advise us that we assess in this journey and implement that? I, I know you know this, but you asked about five really big questions <laughs> there that probably lend themselves to a seminar. Uh, but, but I'd be happy to follow up with any of them. I know we, we'll get short on time, but let me tackle a couple of them. Um, uh, first of all, your first, the first thing you said is how should the, the health system leadership or any of us, uh, the clinical leaders, increasingly, if you're a researcher, you also have an operations piece to your job and you get approached by companies pitching AI. Um, I think especially if they're startups, uh, but, but all, not, not just startups, anybody coming pitching an AI solution, frankly, I think you should have the same level of healthy skepticism that you would somebody coming with a new medical device. Uh, that you didn't know before. And I think the problem is before, in the early days, people come there like, oh my gosh, it's AI, you can't really understand, but this is amazing and it's very promissory. And I, I disagree. I think they actually have to be willing to show you the, the validation um, or ask, are we partnering in research on the validation? Because we're, if we're a research 
organization uh, and a real commitment to that uh, validation uh, so that it can inform the second steps you gave. Uh, they have to be open even if they can show you some validation or, or they've deployed in other areas. They have to be able to want to work with you on the usability, which was your second uh, point. Um, I think a lot, way too little thought about how it would be deployed and integrated to not just do, have happened to us what happened with the EHR, like just adding on to what we do then. That's not going to help. I need to, it has to actually help us. Um, so I would just, I think there it's, you know, the solutions will grow in their evidence base and, the, and the, their actual impact they can potentially show, but just have that same level of healthy skepticism that we normally have about new therapeutics, but for some reason AI was getting the, the wave through like, oh, this is great. Just, I just think that it was wrong. Uh, let's get back to being the usual scientists and, and clinicians and researchers that we are and approach it the same way. Yes, there are pressure. If it's a, especially startups don't have enough, uh, and I feel for them, they don't have enough runway or funding sometimes. And so they want to skip uh, steps, but I, I'd be, be careful. Don't try not to do that uh, if possible. Um, um, but there could be real interesting research there too. So the, an alternative is to say, well, then we'll do this uh, with you, but we, we want to be able to assess it and publish uh, the way we would anything else. Um, bias and interpretability. Um, lots of concerns about it, rightful concerns about it. First of all, if you use data that is biased and non-representative, you're just so likely to have uh, a bias. Uh, and that's why these risk prediction models based on things like EHR data or other things are, are a problem because some people don't have equal access to the healthcare system or don't have the data in the EHR, et cetera, et cetera. That's why things like potentially biometric data and, and, um, and or biomarker data and or imaging data, if we can get it on representative samples, it should significantly help reduce the issues of bias. Um, there are evolving tech techniques. They're not perfect, but they've started to be published on how to assess models for bias. And this is a huge step forward because there are ways to mitigate bias in the development steps. Let's get down in the weeds of machine learning data scientists that are beyond me. I collaborate with them, but, but I think it's really important that they're actually aware of and deploy these to, to assess for bias. And certainly if there's any regulatory thing that's going to lead to clinical decision support, they're, they're going to have to show this. With FDA, FDA is very aware of this. The people in the digital health group are very smart. Um, uh, it's early days, but but they're super aware of that. The last thing is interpretability. That is actually improving. Um, not perfect. Still could be a little black box. But actually now, I, I think we're at the point where if somebody comes to you and says, we have this risk prediction model based on AI, but we it's we can't really explain what components are driving the outcome. I'd just... I'd say thanks for your time, but no thanks, because actually there are pretty good techniques now uh, to take AI machine learning and show which components or groups of components are uh, driving the outcome uh, uh, there. And certainly with things like imaging, I mean, we can read ECGs and we can read studies. If it's interpreting it accurately, we'll have a very good sense of it. So I think interpretation is getting better. Bias is mostly being aware to not use data sources that are biased and assess for it. And on what you should buy, just be be the usual customer we would be about anything else, where the care of our patients is on the line. Perfect, uh, John. That that was fantastic. You know, pearls of wisdom, great advice. So, uh, Dr. Zogby is saying hi, uh, saying thanks for your great <laughs> overview. Uh, agri imaging is cru crucial. Now, coming, how do we improve the robustness of the input data in AI for imaging? Yeah, so that's, again, a whole separate uh, topic and probably one that uh, I'd like to talk with Bill Zogby about and others, you, because it's, it's a, all right, how do I say it without going on too long? It's, it, you don't feed imaging into AI and ML and it spits out the interpretation of the image. That doesn't happen. <laughs> it takes supervised annotation and guidance of what you want it to interpret. You have to feed the data in a way with the feature engineering for it to know how you think it, what matters uh, for the patterns it's, it's looking at. Uh, I'd highly recommend if you haven't already uh, in, in Grand Rounds in the future, ha having Partho Sengupta come, uh, now Chief of Cardiology at Rutgers, as you may know. He can walk you through how he's approached this in ECHO and you'll see in some ways great gains, right? Uh, AIML, for example, in 
constrictive versus restrictive pericarditis is probably better than any of us or most of us, not Dr. Zogby, but many of us. Uh, but even that, look, at you'll see how much work went in to, 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 to be able to do that. So this is going to be, if it's done right, this is heavy lift research, which guess what is always true in basic translational and clinical research. We just can't skip the steps. Uh, but it does take, it's, a, it's not a deep answer to your question, but it, I just want to emphasize that the involvement of clinicians who understand imaging in the development of those models is absolutely essential. It's not magic. Perfect. John, this has been a fantastic session. I just want to close up with one final thought and your feedback. You know, you've been one of those blessed with this versatile experience of working in academic health systems, leading role in a large organization like ACC, and now having really more clarity on the perspective of industry aspiration as well as potential. Now, I see each group's bringing their distinct values and expertise, but I feel we're missing out as don't think we are on the same table and talking candidly as much as we should about aligned goals, how to maximally serve the best interest for our patients and population, truly the core rationale for our existence. So how would you, in your current role and prior see all of us coming together to build focused channels of partnerships with like-minded institutions willing to push the envelope of innovations. Specifically at Meta, do you intend to co-develop digital solutions with health system to achieve their goals? Uh, processes implemented in clinical workflows such they are cost effective, not a burden, and then how do we transfer that to other organizations? So just wanted to get a brief overview of what your strategy moving forward would be to overcome these barriers and silos. Yeah, so I'll keep it I'll keep it brief because I know that the time, but but because it really is an ongoing discussion. The, the short answer for is one, it's early days. Uh, and so there's a thing, everything's open in terms of discussions of collaboration. Certainly no surprise, just like others, tech, uh, health technology focused companies primarily focus on consumer uh, health uh, technology, but that in no way uh, precludes discussions of meaningful collaboration. And I had the opportunity very fortunate. I've known Rob Califf a long time. Uh, we happened to be together a couple of weeks ago, so before his, his FDA confirmation. And as you know, Rob's been at Google, um, and we were both saying the same thing, which is because um, you know he's Duke for years and then at Google. And we were both saying the same things. The actual research that gets done, the data scientists and so forth, are, it feels the same to me. It feels the same as the University of Colorado. It feels the same as the clinical research group and the VA uh, healthcare system and then the work we did at ACC. And so I think you're right. I think there's almost, uh, it's there's lost opportunity that there's so much actual commonality of approach to research, data science, et cetera, that we should strive, strive for more collaboration and more discussion of what would be what problem are we trying to solve? And and you know, tell technology doesn't solve anything by itself. It needs to. We need to know everything I said. <laughs> we need to know what we're, problem we're trying to solve. What's the best methods and data? And then how do we validate it, et cetera? Um, and I see huge promise for us doing that uh, in 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 collaboration. And I know Rob uh, feels the same way. And. I just have to think having him go from his perspective, having been in Duke and then at Google and now being the commissioner of FDA, where certainly this whole digital health and this whole all this AI stuff, I'm telling you about it, he, I mean, he's going to be a champion for that stuff, but in guiding it responsibly, that's his main thing, right? It's about uh, accurate uh, data. So it's an exciting time for all of us in, in cardiology, cardiovascular care and the care of our patients not because it's going to be some magical robot, but because it's going to actually has the promise of making us uh, be able to have more time to, to, to do what we all signed up to do in the first place. And that's the goal, take care of patients and their families. Well, John, thank you so much again, joining so early from San Francisco. Really appreciate that. Uh, amazing talk, uh, lots of food for thoughts and, you know, I hope that we can carry the conversation at ACC first time in person after almost three years. So look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much again for joining us live. Thank you so much. I'll see you at ACC. Take care.